everyone. Welcome to the session on testing and feedback with disabled users here at the XR Access Symposium. I'm Christine Hempel, and it's my absolute pleasure to uh, host this session for you today. I'm the founder and managing director of Open Inclusion. Open is an inclusive research, design and innovation organisation based in the UK and operating globally. At the heart of Open is our Consumer Insight Panel. We have over a thousand people across the UK, USA and Australia with a really wide variety of lived experiences of disability and all sorts of other lived characteristics and, and contexts. Um, and actually access to over 300,000 people through our partner organisations. And today we have an absolutely fabulous panel for you um, to talk about this really important issue, which is really how people with disabilities can be fundamentally involved in user testing, providing both accessibility and inclusive usability feedback throughout the XR ecosystem. Right from early concept through to design and the development and te then testing of any XR content, hardware or usage. In a separate session, we asked Lynn Cox, our panel lead here at Open Inclusion for the Sight Loss community, who's also an artist, coach, trainer and runner, the same set of questions. So at some points during this panel, you'll also hear from her to share another perspective. So Lynn, over to you. Do you want to give a brief introduction to yourself and how you've been involved in user research, specifically thinking about XR? As Christine said, my name's Lynn Cox. I'm blind myself now. But I've gone through all the stages. I never had perfect vision, but I got really good experience of being partially sighted and I lost my reading vision at 17, but I learnt Braille and I lost my colour vision. But I do work as an artist. My first degree was actually in maths and computing. And I think I've always brought through that love of tech. How does it work? Can it work for me? Can it help me? to anything I've done. So when I got the opportunity through an organisation that Open Inclusion morphed into to do some user research, I was up for it, whether it was the physical research going into organisations and seeing what their customer care was like. But for me in particular, initially, it was looking at websites. How accessible are they? Can I use them? And more recently, I've really, really got into um, XR. Oh, thank you so much, Lynn. And it's just that anticipation and excitement of XR right across the community, including people, you know, with, as you say, very limited residual vision, you know, and designing for that delightful experience, you know, irrespective of different access needs. Um, that's why XR is such an exciting format that's coming towards us. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you today to our three panellists here, Randy Huzinek. Randy is a physical therapist based in the USA. He works with individuals who have paralysis from spinal cord injuries. Jamie and Lyon, who I first met when he was working at the BBC, and after almost 11 years working there, he's recently gone onwards to new adventures in the accessibility space. And Kate Mesh, a colleague of mine, a senior inclusive researcher here at Open Inclusion with really deep expertise in the deaf community and signed communication. Welcome you, to, welcome you all today. And if I could just ask each of you um, to just give a quick introduction to yourself and in more detail how you've been involved in research in the XR space. Sure, I'd love to. Um it's such a pleasure to be here today. So as Christine said, uh, I work with Christine at Open Inclusion. We're based in the UK. And my background is with deafness and sign language use, but I'm really happily now in a space where we're doing pan-disability research. And specifically, our projects around XR are one that we did this past year in collaboration with Story Futures, which is an initiative that helps to bring immersive content uh, with a storytelling feature out to the public. And this one in particular was working with an app for children. So we had the feature of asking, how can we recruit disabled children with a variety of access need profiles to work in a museum setting with a pre-created app? We have also done work with collaborators at Brunel University and Cambridge University here in the UK, looking at, uh, again, a pan-disability perspective on XR and specifically VR experiences. Hello, everybody. So uh, I'm Jamie, and uh, Lion is the uh, four-foot plush lion who is not quite on my lap. He's lying next to me today. Um, so I'm neurodivergent, 
Um, and I also have a spinal cord injury, although the way that I normally put it is I've got quite a complex relationship with gravity. Um, and it, weirdly, this is a, a weird time for me, as, as uh, Christine mentioned. I'm starting a big transition. So I'm, I'm, I've been at the BBC, I was at the BBC almost 11 years. And uh, the projects I'm going to talk about mostly there from the BBC. Um, but I'm now moving on to my summer of adventure. So I'm, uh, I'm first myself as an accessibility adventurer. I go do fun stuff with people who need accessibility stuff, nerdy things, strategy things. I love helping hands and making things, um, helping out and making things. Um, and outside of my alley work, I also build a tool for connect, uh, catching different types of financial crime. So my connection to VR is the one of project leads. So at the BBC, um, I was project lead for the XR Barriers Research Project. Um, we worked with over 100 users to understand the barriers within VR. Um, I, my role was uh, kind of project lead. I did a lot of the tech stuff and did the analysis. Um, but the, the facilitation itself was led by uh, Ollie Gross, uh, which we'll come back to later, I'm sure. Um, we did things like switch accessible control and stuff like that. So we were trying to understand where all the barriers were. I am a physical therapist. I work at a large university hospital. And uh, let's, let's be honest. Physical therapy is not exciting. It's usually painful. It's very boring. VR brings a whole different dimension into it. And I use that virtual reality uh, to augment uh, the patient's goals and also make it more in, uh, engaging my challenge is the inclusivity of the current status of virtual reality. So making sure that that person can be as independent within that setting as possible, which is a huge challenge uh, with the current controllers. So that is my biggest challenge. I like to educate. I like to uh, make sure that that person is as engaged in their goals and in the environment as possible. And that's basically what I do. Randy, thank you so much. And you know, to to starting with you know Jamie and Lyon and and then to Kate, in the research that you've just mentioned, you've been involved in what that made that research more challenging, and how did you ma navigate that through in terms of your research design, the actual running of the research, all the analysis following from that. You know, what what was the most interesting learnings that you took from that research? So there's a few bits and bobs. Um, I think I can actually build immediately on something Randall said, which is, yeah, controllers were one of our major barriers. So we, we're, we're doing this research to try and understand the barriers of VR. And of course, we, we go out to a, a SEND school, special educational needs school, sometimes called a special school. And, um, you know, the first four kids we work with, they can't hold the controllers. They literally can't get through the door. So one of the things was that in order to understand the smaller barriers, we had to actually solve some of the bigger barriers. Um, so we built switch accessible controls. So you could control it from ping pong switch, bite switches, blow switches and all that sort of stuff. So I guess one of the things was we had to start solving some of the barriers before we could even understand the barriers. Um, and that, that was kind of a novel approach. We kind of took this idea of if we understand, you know, there's a mismatch between a person and their environment that results in disability. So if we can understand the barriers that cause that mismatch, and then we can help people understand the assumptions that lead to those barriers, then we can help people to have better assumptions and then not introduce the barriers. And it's a lot easier to resolve a barrier by not, it, it not existing than it is to try and fix it at the far end. Jamie and Lynn, that was so much that would be a jumping off point for us as well. But we have one big distinction, which is that we often work with commercial clients and we don't necessarily have the ability to make changes to either the technology of the hardware or the software at the beginning when we're starting to do the testing. So what we ended up doing with our practice was we started by asking, first, is this something that we can test at all? Is it in a, pos in a position where we can bring it to various disabled users and know that they can do something with it? And this is, of course, a question about built environment just as much as it is about technology, because sometimes we were working with, for example, apps that are meant to be held up on a phone. And one of them, as an example, was a trail that you were meant to actually walk along in physical space, a trail that had been created inside London. Um, and there were just components of it that might not work for people with different access needs. So we, we had questions about curb cuts in this trail, right? How can, we, how can we test this here if it's not quite ready? So we needed to come back quickly and tell our clients, okay, this is what we think would be necessary on the built environment side, and this is what we think would be necessary on the technology side to test. Then you get to the second question, which is, are you creating 
too many barriers to participation when you really need to get somebody in the door and actually get the chance to find out the valuable insights that they have. So we ended up creating a system where we would say, out of the box, does it work? And when the answer was no, then we moved on to a second phase, which is a bit similar to what you're describing, Jamie and Lyon. The difference was, in our case, we were often using Wizard of Oz style approaches. So we were saying something like, hmm, out of the box, if it doesn't work, what can we do right now to move us forward in the experience, even if that's having a human provide a simulation of a screen reader? Or if that's, um, and I know I'm getting into facilitation a bit, but this is still trying to talk about challenges because um, this is, as you might imagine, not a very immersive experience. To have someone stand next to you and mimic a screen reader is not immersive content anymore. So a big challenge in working specifically in XR is trying to figure out how to move forward, make sure that you can get the insight that you need to make the fixes that you that you need, and work around the response that you'll get that, that really is an artifact of the testing, which is that participants say, huh, this is not very immersive at all. Um, and then, of course, this is a challenge for analysis because you have to decide, well, which bits of this are relevant for the creation of the product that's at play here. Um, Specifically, uh, if you have a client, for example, that's really interested in software approaches, and we get a lot of comments, just as you did, Jamie and Lyon, about um, about dexterity, um, dexterity needs and the failures of current controllers. Uh, what do you do with that? So, as an example, how do you how do you filter? We've said things like, well, what we would really like is to have a totally new set of controllers. Our client isn't going to do anything with that information, so what we're going to tell them is, yes, that, but also. What you might notice is that you can do some things with the joystick on the current controllers that would mimic some of these larger gestures that are impossible under the current circumstances. So let's show you what the software side would need to look like in order to enable something like joystick controls rather than larger gesture controls. So I hope that starts to walk us into the territory of, okay, how do you assess if you can test? How do you start to think about getting somebody into this space and what's challenging specifically about XR? We actually did a thing that we ended up calling the flip-flop support model. So funnily enough, we went off to do these sessions and we went with, with the user testing team. And very quickly, the support person that was with me, whose main job is to stop me getting hit by cars and help me get to places, suddenly turned out to have the perfect skills for supporting people in VR. And his role is kind of, because one of the things that, that like VR is fundamentally different from other things is the capability of harm. You can come to a lot more harm in a VR in, in test environment than you can in others, than most others. So uh, Ollie Gross's experience of keeping me safe and other autistic people safe, like crossing London, ended up coming in really useful for keeping people safe in VR. We nicknamed it the flip-flop support model um, because it's building on social care support. It's building on you know care and support rather than the facilitation skills. And um, the reason why we went with flip-flop is because Ollie walks everywhere with flip-flops. And if you think about it, a flip-flop is just enough shoe. It's just enough shoe to prevent harm. And the amount of support that Ollie was giving was just enough support to prevent harm. So we ran into a situation where we were testing uh, a currently existing technology right out of the box, and it doesn't have captions. And we were bringing in uh, profoundly deaf testers. So the entire experience depends on you being able to follow a story that's being presented to you only in an auditory format. And we asked ourselves, okay, how could we make this work? Uh, one possibility is that we could create captions that we could show a person in advance, but this is a bit of a memory challenge, right? You have to read all of the captioning without actually having the immersive content with you, then try to remember it, bring it into the immersive content. It will break the immersive experience, but you will be informed. So we tried that. And what we found was that it heightened participants' sense that this wasn't designed for them. The very exclusionary feature that we wanted to design around, that we wanted to improve, was highlighted here. And participants said, I know that now there are supposed to be voices telling me this story, but I'm just completely aware of the fact that the story isn't being told to me. And people talked about a, a very familiar and relatable experience, which is I've spent good money as much as the next person to have this experience, but it wasn't designed for me. So that feature was was really challenging. And then we tried um, a pass-through feature. So pass-through is one of the features that's available on the Oculus Quest. You can either tap on the side of it, or there are different ways to activate pass-through, but it means that now you can keep the headset on, but you can see 
via a camera's image what would be in front of you. And we tried having people tap for pass-through so we could hold up captions in real time. Breaks the experience. Doesn't really work for people. Um, makes people feel like they've been drawn out of the story, but does convey information in a slightly better sequence. And then we tried um, a version where people would actually, well, the challenge with, with this was also that in pass-through, we weren't pausing the experience. And so actually when you turned on pass-through mode, sometimes the experience would continue and you would lose the sequence anyway. And then we tried a version which was take off the headset, which will automatically pause it, look at the captions. This more than anything breaks the experience. So it doesn't work well. It's not pleasant for the testers, but by the end of this, we had an insight that we never would have had otherwise, which is that testers really wanted diarization, speaker diarization. They wanted to know not just that someone was speaking, hence the caption, but also a clear distinction between speakers. And we found this because when we did the version where we gave the captions in advance and it was obvious that there were two speakers, this came up over and over with our deaf testers. Hmm, well, I know that now I'm supposed to be receiving information that I'm not getting, and it's supposed to be from one of the two speakers, and I don't know which one. So this diarization request really came out of this clearly flawed process, right? There's This isn't how we would wish to test it. And yet we still had something really positive come out of it. When you're actually doing the research, you know, I know that you've been involved in some research where the experience itself was not fully inclusive for people, you know, with significant sight loss. How have you found ways, you know, with the researcher to provide really meaningful feedback, despite the fact that it's not yet coded and wasn't yet designed in a fully accessible format for you? Well, this often happens with the um, XR in particular. So it's given me, I think, time to settle into the research, you know, explain what it is, what it should be doing, then giving me the ability to play about with it myself, even if I can't do anything, but we can check I can't do anything. And then maybe just saying, well, at this point, there's, you know, on the screen, there's a set of instructions. They might read the instructions to me. Now, at this point, what would you do? And I say, well, I'd, I'd hit the OK button or I'd go into the menu and I'd look for. And a lot of the time they have to do that bits for me. And then I can get in to a lot of, especially VR, and I can sense the projects. I can tell if it's got 3D audio, if it's got the haptics. I can picture that I can move around the room um, and it feels really comfortable but actually a lot of the time without having the opportunity to say well this might work better you know or some VR is just for me like watching the TV so what's the point of doing this as a VR you know how can a designer enrich that experience so it gives you a sense of what they're trying to do and how they're trying to do it you know, if there's something that's a visual clue, can it be a visual haptic and an auditory clue? You know, so it's thinking about the multiplicity, I think, of the products. And a lot of the time, to be honest, the, the VR and the XR at the minute isn't quite there. But, you know, I've been doing it now for two years and we're starting to get some improvements and I'm starting to use bits of it. I think the worry for me is that if you don't get that interface right and the experience right from the beginning, from me purchasing a headset, say for VR, setting it up, putting the program in, working with the program, oh, I can't even get into the program, you know, and then the experience itself and then being able to shut it down. And there's an extra layer, of course, if I'm doing VR and I'm playing some game, I want to know I'm getting on with my daughters because they might be doing it better than I am. <laughs> so it's getting that social aspect of it right too. And I think it will get there and I can see improvements. Randy, I do want to bring you into this conversation and particularly as someone who's that kind of intermediary user, that's still a really powerful and important role in XR, whether it's health professionals, educators in an education sense, people in workplace training, supporting their employees. How do you feel, you know, what would make research more valuable and helpful to the role you have? And particularly thinking of as an intermediary, but also understanding the physical access needs of the people that you're supporting. 
So uh, that's a good point. And uh, once again, I love that flip-flop too. And uh, that is one of uh, the big struggles that I have is once again, just giving enough assistance to engage in a a consumer product. And uh, once again, I deal with mostly consumer products, not custom uh, products. So uh, as far as the research is concerned, I would say what would be really beneficial is to make sure that with the commercial products that are available to really have some type of uh, heading on that uh, on that software to really sort of, uh, I think they're doing this in gaming, but to, to make sure that the person with a, a dexterity or a mobility deficit or a hearing deficit or a vision deficit knows exactly what they're getting into. Uh, and uh, making sure that uh, once again, one product does not fit one person uh, perfectly, uh, and that's true with mobility, vision, and so forth, but to make sure that in general terms that they can use that product by just reading a summary of the, uh, the product itself. I think that would help the, the, uh, the person that's using the product and also the person that's educating uh, the person, the new person that's going into uh, virtual reality or mixed reality. Thank you, Randy. I think, you know, it's there's so much that is still being learned and that can be uh, improved on in this space, but also it's always moving further forward faster. So as researchers, it's how do we keep hacking what we have to keep providing insight back to the designers and the developers of the hardware and software so that they can provide you with the best quality experience that you can then support others with. I just want to, I know we're just about at time, but um, Jamie and Lyon, if I can start with you, what final thoughts would you have to listeners to help them really design you know, research that will give them very actionable, practical insights for XI user engagement? I think there's there's like two or three thoughts that come together and funnily they actually build on each other. Uh, the first one also builds on what Kate mentioned before. So nailing down the scope, understanding what it is that you're testing and what you plan to do with this research next. Are you testing an interaction? Are you testing an item of content? Are you testing a mechanic? Um, we, we, one of the distinctions um, that we made, so if the actual research that we did is all published up on the website and it's a list of the the most common barriers that we observed. Um, and um, one of the most important ones there was um, kind of, is this a coordinated thing, you know, multiple hands working together, or is this a single thing? So when you come to mechanics. The next part of it is about um, kind of focusing on the barriers. So if you, if you, if you observe a barrier, so an example would be we, we had a lot of users who dropped the controller, uh, and then that was a combination of two things. The first one, uh, so, so a user would say drop a controller, now, it would be really easy to say that the barrier is the user's dexterity, but it's not. It's the assumptions that led to that. So the designer and developer had made the assumption that the user could hold something, and they made the assumption that the user could reach the floor. So if we can identify the barriers, we can work forward from the barriers to look at solutions, but we can also work backwards to the barriers to work on the assumptions that were made that got them there. And that's why we published the barriers list. The barriers list are a list of things that happen in VR. So it's like um, the experience expected the user to be able to hold something in a consistent location and a consistent orientation for an extended period. That's an assumption. So if, if, if developers and designers look through that list, they can ch- challenge their assumptions in those areas and then hopefully design out the barriers. And then that's kind of the third thing, which is by doing the barrier-placed approach, you're validating the problem before you look for solutions. Because... I was amazed. When, when, when we first started working with blind users, I was astonished, actually, how much could get done. We, we had, uh, we had a, 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 in an unadapted environment, we worked with some users with exceptionally low vision who would say to us, I, I'm less impaired in VR than I am in real life. It's so bright. It's right, in, it's right by my eyes. This is wonderful. You know, and we had, you know, I made the joke, it'd be very un-BBC, but if we had boxes sat there and said, yep, sure, take one, take one home, a thousand pounds, we would have sold a stack of them from people who just said, this is a transformational experience for me. 
And that's kind of the whole thing about VR, right, and XR. If we're just replicating the barriers that exist in real life, then we're, we're, do, we're doing it wrong. We're letting the people down. It's, it's, it's got this potential. It's got this ability to turn potential into reality. And that's kind of the, the thing that I think we should be chasing. Um, I also believe that looking at the barriers and the solutions is the way to go and realizing that we, we want to strive for a universal design, but knowing that that's not going to work for everybody. So also being open to uh, modular components for the hardware and also adaptations within the software, uh, looking back once again to uh, gaming as a, a resource. I think that's so crucial. And just looking at, uh, like Jamie said, those barriers and how to solve them, I think is key. And uh, re really just looking at a wide variety of people as well. Uh, one person with the same level of paralysis in my field can access something completely different than another person with the same level. They might use voice control, they might use eye gaze, whatever and just looking at those variations and making sure that they're covered. The piece that I have that I hope everyone will find to be obvious, but it really needs to be stressed, is doing the things that we've described takes extra time. It takes extra time in the planning phase because ideally you're making an informed hypothesis, but you are hypothesizing about what's going to go wrong and that will help. Then it takes extra time in testing. So I loved your example, Jamie and Lyon, of the, the controllers and what happened that took 10 minutes to resolve. That's 10 minutes of a testing session that you need to be prepared to lengthen, right? Um, our longest introduction to a headset and controllers took about 40 minutes, and it was for a participant who was in her 80s and who had never been exposed to this type of technology before. It took us about 40 minutes to try on the headset, almost like a set of swim goggles, and say, you can take it back off. You don't have to have the straps. And then 40 minutes in, she took off. I love it. I want to try absolutely everything. And we had enough time in the session to try absolutely everything. But we were quite lucky. We actually have um, three-hour testing sessions for this particular project. So uh, some of our participants could do quite a lot in three hours. We took 40 minutes of it to get the headset on. And that was a beautiful use of our time because it enabled everything going forward. I think the first and foremost one for me is early engagement with disabled people. So I was listening to a podcast today and it was talking about something else, but it was a great, great idea. You know, if I'm involved and other people are involved early on with our needs, it's going to be more inclusive. So just think of a fire in a pan. If you've got the extinguisher at the beginning, it's dead easy to put that fire out. But if, the, if you know, if... Then it takes over the room and the kitchen. That's harder to do with one extinguisher. And if it takes over the whole house, you're really stuck. You know, one extinguisher is going to do very little to that. So I want to be in at the extinguisher at the fire stage. I want to help. I want other people to be in so early that it's not an add-on and it's not awkward and it's not going to cost a fortune because you've thought about it right, right from the beginning. And when I say that, it's not just consult with me as a visually impaired person. You know, I'm quite techy. I love tech. That there's people out there that aren't. There's people out there that can see something. There's there's people. You know, we're all range. You know, we're not just one homogenous group visually impaired. You know, we we vary. You know, just like people with social economic different disabilities, you know, often you get multiple disabilities. Just get an old bunch of us in there right at the beginning and helping to design it with you because then you'll have products that are truly, truly inclusive. Thank you to all of you. What a fabulous session. I'm going to just summarize your key takeaways because I think there's five that you just shared that are so powerful for everyone who's thinking about doing user research in XR with people with disabilities. Firstly, make sure the scope is defined. It's very hard to solve a problem that you're not sure what that problem is. So really defining the scope of the research and knowing what you're there to do and what you're not. And Jamie and Lyon and Kate, it's been really interesting hearing the two of you because, of course, you've worked on very different scopes that have given you more or less flexibility around that. Secondly, be barrier focused that, you know, Jamie and Randall, Randy, you've both kind of really shared that 
the barrier focus first and then working backwards to assumptions and forwards to solutions, I think is a delightful way to think about barriers. Um, then validating the problem before looking for solutions is another one. We've found so many different ways over um, and you had a delightful example of that, Jamie and Lyon, so thank you. Making sure that there is user choice, you know, that is critical and comes through in pretty well all the work we've ever done is give people the options because we can't predict exactly what people will like, how they operate, what they prefer, what environment they might be in at the time they're using it. Choice is so valuable in terms of adaptive and inclusive design. And then that time for adaptability, the, the biggest difference probably between user research and inclusive user research is additional time to consider and to consider through a whole lot of lenses so that you can make sure the environment is safe, so that you can think about what sort of flip-flop support model you might need to bring in, but also what sort of protections you need before you start to make sure that people are in a really you know, good, safe environment and also just supported so that their energy is spent in the research, not getting there or getting away or worrying about things while they are there. So much to take away from this conversation. Thank you to you all. And uh, everyone, enjoy the rest of the XR Access Symposium. We look forward to seeing you there. Take care. We'll be at the Q&A shortly. Mm -hmm.